بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته respected brothers and sisters esteemed disciples and disciples viewers watchers and listeners we greet you with the greetings of al-islam and we welcome you to this session which we ask allah azza wa jal to make uh, a session which is considered to be blessed bidin lahi ta'ala full of khair full of faida full of education and full of reminder amin the topic as it was announced is going to be dealing with something that is sensitive something that is important something that is neglected and swept under the rug but something that is considered to be on the front line in the modern age the modern era with the old and with the young but specifically for those who are in the middle those who are a bit young not as bad those who are a bit older not as bad those who are in the middle very very critical and very dangerous and that is the concept of sex education sexual awareness in light of the prophetic sunnah of the messenger of allah alayhi salatu wasalam education and awareness on sensitive topics i don't think there could be a topic that's more sensitive than something that many people refrain from speaking about even though it is a basic staple part of life a basic staple part of life he who reads the quran on kareem is going to find Allah Azza wa Jal mentioning the original creation of Adam alayhi salam and how he created his wife and his partner and the reason why he created that woman from Adam alayhi salam and how there were steps and stages in the existence of their offspring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made huwa alladhi ja'alakum min nafsin wahida he made you from one nafs and from that nafs he made his zawj for a purpose when they fulfilled that purpose in the first initial step there was another step and then came the children Allah Azza wa Jal he gives us instructions prohibitions commandments and recommendations with regards to the two sexes how they are to live and how they aren't to live this is in the Quran a general view as far as the hadith of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam they want to read to you a few of them that give us the perfect solution to this presupposed problem something that's sensitive something that is looked down upon something that is culturally taboo something that we have to deal with but we are too afraid too shy to embarrass to deal with in light of the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam sunnah and before that bidin allah ta'ala i want to mention a few points which makes this topic considered uh difficult or sensitive number one is uh that islam is a religion that commands you to have what we call haya and those who study the arabic language they know that the word haya is very similar to another word in the arabic language called hayat hayatun and hayaun the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he told us al imanu bid'un wa sittuna shu'bah fa'alaha qawlu la ilaha illallah وَأَدْنَاهَا إِمَاتَةُ الْأَذَى عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِنَ الْإِمَانِ Narrated Abu Hurairah in Sahih Bukhari in Sahih Muslim Iman composes over 60 branches, 60 levels, 60 stations The highest of them being saying La ilaha illallah And the lowest of them being removing harmful matter from the road After the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told you about the first rank and the last rank Station 1 and Station 60 He then gave you something that he didn't specify what number or what rank it's in or it's on وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ He said Haya is a branch of faith Why did he say this? Even though he gave us 60 different levels and stations The people of knowledge, they say Every single thing that you do of Iman Every branch of Iman is based off of Haya is based off of Haya. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he discusses the argument of those scholars who say that Haya 
is derived and extracted from hayat. And he also discusses those ulama who say that hayat comes from hayat. Which of the two is first? The chicken or the egg? The egg or the chicken? The hen and the rooster? Hayat, we didn't translate what it means yet. No hayat, those who speak the Arabic language, they know what they mean. And those who don't, we're leaving it out for a reason, for a purpose. Which of the two comes first? One word means shyness, and another word means life. Which came first? Was it life, then shyness? Or was it shyness, then life? Or are we being spoken to in a manner that tells us your life is supposed to be based off of haya, from the beginning to the end? Just like your iman, your tawheed, the branches of faith. Everything that you do from salah, from zakat, from saying la ilaha illallah, removing something harmful from the road, is based off of haya, that you're shy and that you're bashful. Everybody understand this? The Prophet والسلام, he also tells us in several ahadith about the fruits of haya, of shyness. Saying, إِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ لَا يَأْتِي إِلَّا بِخَيْرٍ دَعْهُ فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ مِنَ الْإِمَانِ Ahadith kathira. The Prophet tells us about the virtue of haya. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, the two words are intertwined. There is no true life without shyness. And there is no true shyness unless there is true life. So when we get to a topic, start talking about sex, sexuality, sexual intercourse, modern day practices and acts and things like this, it's natural for the Muslim to feel shy and for, Muslim to, for the Muslim to feel bashful and not to talk about some of these private, intimate, personal things. However, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he explains that there's a difference between al-haya or shari the legitimate, legislative shyness, and between cowardice between weakness, between a person making himself incapable and avoiding the necessary bravery that he is or she is supposed to have. There's an obligation, there's a mandatory duty that I must do. I can't say I'm too shy. That's no longer praiseworthy. That's no longer the hayat that is connected to hayat. However, if this isn't the case, there isn't a time in which a Muslim should be separated from shyness. Even when you stand up for the truth and speak the truth, you still have to have and keep a level of shyness. So this, in my humble opinion, is one of the main reasons why a topic like this is so sensitive. Because you have to speak the truth, you have to explain, you have to clarify, but at the same time, you have to be shy. You have to be shy. The next point is, um, one of the five maxims that the fuqaha of Islam explain, one of the five major principles of fiqh, they say, al adatu muhakkama. They say that the custom, the tradition, the normal practice of the people, it is a source of judgment. It's a judge. It's a major place and time to go back when you don't have specific and explicit proofs and evidences. We don't find no verses in the Quran, no hadith of the Prophet. We don't find no ijma, we don't find no qiyas and things like this. We go back to the customs of the people. Rather, with regards to the commandments of Allah and that of His Messenger that are inexplicit, the explicit details of those commandments oftentimes are found in the customs of the people. In the customs of the people. Allah says, He commands you to worship Him and none but Him. And you treat your parents kindly. You treat them in a benevolent manner. How do you treat your mother kindly? What does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi tell us about doing things for your mother? Taking your mother out, taking out the trash, buying her flowers, taking her to go eat, sitting and drinking tea with her. All of these things are only known and practiced through what? Custom and culture. So therefore, if we have something in my culture which is looked down upon, we don't talk about, we don't bring it up, it's totally taboo. What is the line between the need of my teenage son, the curiosity of my teenage daughter, the problem of my son and my daughter in school and in high school, and keeping my culture, even if it isn't an issue of hayat, shyness. And oftentimes the culture is based off of shyness but there is a limit so therefore it's a tug of war now what comes first being real with my son being honest with my son helping out my teenage daughter or sticking to my cultures it's unfathomable for you to ask me that question back in my original country or when i was growing up or when i came up so this is one of the reasons why this topic becomes so touchy and sensitive number three is that which we call or that the islamic concept of refraining from being obscene Refraining from lewdness. When you start talking about sex and sexuality, 
You don't necessarily have to be lewd. You don't necessarily have to be nasty and to be a person who uses obscenities. However, when you speak on a topic like that, it's a doorway to obscenities. And for this reason, many body parts, many sexual practices, many acts, and the colloquial terms are what? They're curse words. They're curse words. And it's well known when you want to express yourself, talking about the opposite sex, you use a curse word. Whether it's a woman, what you call a woman, what you call a man, this part of the body, this act, and so on and so forth. So from one aspect, they're not connected. And from another aspect, these two concepts are what? They're connected. And the Muslim is not to be obscene. The Muslim is not to use profane language. Everybody understand this? So this makes the topic very sensitive and very slippery. Because many people, they don't want to walk on the black ice. Because I could slip and I could fall. From one aspect, I have to talk about it. But if I go too far, I end up cursing. I end up saying something that's bad and disgusting and filthy. And the Muslim is not to be like this. Another reason is, or another very important concept that makes the, the, the topic so sensitive, is that you are prohibited as a Muslim to withhold knowledge. Knowledge which someone is in need of. Someone is in need of this ilm. They ask you a question. You know the answer. Or you can steer them in the direction of getting the correct answer, and you hinder that ilm. That is a major sin in the Prophet's sunnah. So what is the case of your son, of your daughter, someone who's your own flesh and blood, who asks you about something, they have curiosity, they have a need, and you refrain from speaking to them. You don't talk about it, not right now, or not in this place, or don't worry about that, don't focus on that, don't ask questions like that, don't think like that, that's dirty, that's nasty, that's bad, that's so on and so forth. So that's a major problem, and it makes the topic sensitive. Because some people, they may speak on it without the proper knowledge, without the proper qualifications, but they know that they have to do what? They have to talk about it. Because it is unlawful to hinder people from knowledge that you know, as the Prophet has taught us. One fourth is that which we call Ada'ul Amana. Ada'ul Amana. You have to fulfill the trust, the Amana that Allah Azza wa has placed on your shoulders. You being a parent, you being a guardian, it's not just feeding, it's not just clothing, it's not just sending your child to college. But you're supposed to be the friend. You're supposed to be the companion. You're supposed to be someone that your child can confine in and tell a secret. This happened and I'm embarrassed. This is the true, thorough, complete parent or guardian. So if they come to you and they ask you a question, or I had an experience, or I feel a certain way, is it permissible for Muslims to do this, so on and so forth, it is an amana for you to first and foremost listen. Secondly, for you to give the necessary advice, which is going to come. And thirdly, for you to keep that secret. And for them to have the trust and the confidence. If I go and talk to Ummi, she's going to keep it between me and her, and she's not going to tell Abby. If I talk to Abby, my father, it's a conversation between son and father, daughter and father, not aunt, grandmother, imam at the masjid, so on and so forth, unless it is necessary. So this is a very important concept, and Allah will ask you about the amana on the Day of Judgment. The next reason why it becomes such a sensitive topic is what the people of knowledge say, La yajuzu ta'khirul bayani an waqt al haja. It is unlawful for you to delay and for you to defer and procrastinate and giving the people the necessary information at the time of need. There's a difference between the two. You may ask me a question and you don't need it right now. It's not pending, it's not pressing. It's not something that you need immediately so I can say come back later on we'll talk about it. We'll discuss it in a couple of years. We'll talk about it later, so on and so forth. But when there's a need, Abby, I'm falling into something. I have these thoughts. I have these feelings. I go to school. I saw it on television. A person has doubts. He has desires. It is unlawful for you to delay and procrastinate speaking on the issue immediately. And if you yourself can't do it, then it is upon you, as we said, to steer your son or your daughter in the direction of someone who can. Moving forward. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he told us in a few simple words, Adin al nasiha He said the religion is a nasiha And the word nasiha is much more than just advice. It's much more than just sincere advice. But the original meaning of nasiha in the tongues of the Arabs, or the tongue of the Arabs, it means transparency. It means to be sheer. It means for someone to look through one side of the glass and they can see out the other side of the glass. This is nasiha, to be like this glass of water. I'm not hiding anything from you. I'm not being fake. I don't have two faces. If you ask me and I know the answer, I'll give it to you. 
If I fell into something, if I did something, you were my advice, you were my opinion, I want to be transparent with you. And then comes the concept of giving advice. Because I only give advice because I'm transparent. I see that you're doing something wrong. You don't ask me anything as my son. I know you're doing something wrong. I was 16 once. I was 19 once. I was 15 once. I know what you're doing in the bathroom when you go out, when you do this. I see you take off your khimar when you leave the house. I see it. But I don't say anything because it's too hurtful. It's too painful. It's too embarrassing. That can't be my daughter. Impossible. That can't be my son. Impossible. So when I hide and I refrain from giving that necessary advice, it shows that my glass of water is not clear at all. That I see something, I smile, I sit down, but it's something in my heart that feels otherwise. And that goes against the concept of nasiha. The Prophet ﷺ, he repeated it three times. And they asked the question, who is the nasiha for? What is the nasiha for? How do we perform and practice the nasiha? And this proves that the word nasiha is much more than just advice. Qala lillah. He says it's nasiha for Allah. How can you advise Allah? How do you give nasiha to Allah? You see a brother doing something wrong, say give him nasiha. Most people, they think narrowly of the term nasiha that it only means to give advice. If that's what it means, then how do you give nasiha to Allah? How do you advise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You can't advise Allah as though who knows everything, who taught you how to think and feel. So the word nasiha has a different meaning, and it means sincerity, transparency. It means purity, being real, being upfront, not hiding anything in front of the people, and behind closed doors, you deal with Allah one way. Allah sees me, Allah, Allah hears me, no matter what I do, no matter where I go. My son and my daughter, good, bad, righteous, wicked, young, old, it's my job to be transparent with them. So this makes the topic sensitive because many of us are not real with ourselves. We're not transparent with ourselves, let alone with our children. Moving forward, uh, the major sin of speaking about Allah without proper knowledge. Abi, is this act permissible? No, it's haram. You can't do it. Is this haram to do it? No, that's okay. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Should I do this? Should I go here? Should I wait? What's best? He says, well, no, in Islam, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. And he has lied about Allah because he doesn't have the proper knowledge. If you don't know, then say, I don't know, but I will steer you in the direction of someone who does know. So many people, because they're so afraid of talking about Allah without knowledge, which is a major sin, they automatically neglect the subject, huh, at whole. And then the child is totally lost and confused. So it makes the topic even more slippery and even more difficult. The next major vice is saying that what the Messenger of Allah didn't say. There is a hadith in which the Prophet prohibited this act. There's a hadith in which the Messenger of Allah said, don't ask this question. And he never said that. There is no such hadith. Or there is a hadith that's totally weak, that's totally fabricated. So when you talk about an issue and you quote a hadith without the proper knowledge, you've made a major sin and you have bought your ticket in the fire of hell. The next concept that's very important is for us to make a difference between that which is Islamically haram, legislatively prohibited, and that which is looked down in my culture and in my custom. Now obviously you're going to say, Khalid, didn't you say al adam muhakkama the custom takes precedence, the custom is the judge. As long as the customs don't go against the Quran and Sunnah. Allah says, do this. The Prophet says, there's nothing wrong with that. But my custom says the exact opposite. You can't do that. You can't ask that. You can't practice that. So therefore, I have to make a difference between when I was growing up, something that's considered to be bad, disgusting, unfathomable and something that is permissible in al-Islam and there's a huge difference between the two and most people they mix and they confuse them moving forward is being open adamul mujamala is not to glaze not to sugarcoat not to beat around the bush and not to say that which is comfortable and convenient to your children be open be direct it's no need to hold back say what you know Say what you don't know, I don't know. Give them your opinion, your feeling. Tell them based off of your experiences. But the moment you hide things, the moment you say something that you really don't feel, the moment you agree with something that you know and feel is wrong, you have now done something which is a major crime against yourself and your child. Atajamalta. You're not being sarih, you're not being open, you're not being frank. You're not being open, and that goes back to the nasiha as we just mentioned. Moving forward. 
um, is the major principle of fiqh that the ulama mentioned, irtikab akhaf al-dararin, is taking and bearing the brunt of the least of the two problems, the smaller of the two harms. There are two things, I can't avoid both of them, but at best, I can avoid the most painful, the most damaging, the most dangerous. So I have two options now. Number one is talking about something that's embarrassing, talking about something that's very uh, shameful, or I can deal with the consequences when my son comes home, or when my daughter comes home, or when I get a phone call, or I get a message. Which of the two? You can't avoid both. There's no turning back the pages of history. Your daughter says, I did such and such an act. It's done. You can't go back. Khalas, it's decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So move forward. Look at the bigger problem ahead of you. Am I going to avoid it or am I going to fall into that problem once more? Very important principle for regards to parenting. Moving forward, last but not least is considering the differences between age and between maturity. You can't expect your conversation about sexual issues between an eight-year-old to be between a 19-year-old. There's a word of a difference. Someone who's mature mentally and physically is not like a little small kid who says, Abby, where do children come from? How do, how do babies come? Why is mommy's stomach really big? Where did the baby come from? Obviously, you're going to talk to that young child in a manner that suits the child's mind, wisdom, knowledge, and capabilities. That's not the same as a big, huge teenager who has a body, who has feelings, who has emotions, who has hormones. And many parents, they do this. They want to simplify things, birds and the bees, and your son is in college. He's 19, 20 years old. There's no more birds and bees anymore. You have to talk to him like a man because he sees the world like a man. He has feelings and emotions just like you do as a man. He lacks wisdom. For most, in most cases, there are many young men that are wise. But in most cases, wisdom comes with age. Wisdom comes with experience, and experience only comes through age. In most cases, and not all cases. So these are what I consider to be the next panel ta'ala, some of the most important factors for tackling this difficult and sensitive topic. Tackling this difficult and sensitive topic. And when we get to these hadith, it's going to become clear why I mentioned this before those hadith. Khairan, inshallah, let's get started with one narration. Uh, and it is what Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah has collected in his Sahih. And hadith is also collected by Imam Muslim. Reading from Fath al-Bari, al-Hafidh Abu Abdullah al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he says, fi kitab al-talaq, babu idha talaqaha thalathan, thumma tazawwajat ba'da al-iddati zawjan ghayruhu falam yamassaha. حدثنا عمرو بن علي قال حدثنا يحيى قال حدثنا هشام قال حدثني أبي عن عائشة عن النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام حا حدثنا عثمان بن أبي شيبة قال حدثنا عبدة عن هشام عن أبي عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أن رفاعة القرذي تزوج امراة ثم طلقها فتزوجت آخر فأتت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فذكرت له أنه لا يأتيها وأنه ليس معه إلا مثل هدبة فقال لا حتى تذوق عسيلته ويذوق عسيلتك امام البخاري he says the chapter of divorce كتاب الطلاق and in this chapter he mentions a subheading by saying اذا طلقها ثلاثا when a man divorces his wife for the third and final time they can no longer live with each other and she cannot get back with that initial husband they cannot reconcile until she marries another man and not only marries that man not only is it actual, valid Islamic marriage, but there must be intimate relations. So what happens when a woman marries a man and she doesn't have intimate relations with that man, the second husband? She was divorced from the first husband. She did her idda. She got remarried. She married a new man. And for one reason or another, there was no intimacy. They never slept with each other. And she regrets, she regrets being with this new man. She doesn't like him. She doesn't want him. She wants to go back to the first man. But for one reason or another, they did not have relations. Imam al-Bukhari, he gives you his isnad, his sanad, that goes back to Hisham ibn Urwa, from his father, Urwa ibn Zubair, who narrated from Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that there was a man whose name was Rifa'a al-Quradi. This Sahabi's name was Rifa'a. And he had a wife. And he divorced this woman. Other narrations, it states that this woman's name was Tumayma bint Wahab. And some ulama, they say Tamima. 
the Qawl al-Rajih who al-Thani, Tumayma. So this woman Tumayma, she was divorced by this man Rifa'ah. And he divorced her three times. Unlawful for them to live with each other. So as time went on, she remarried another man. And she didn't like this man for one reason or another. So she went to the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, and she complained to the Prophet sallallahu Listen carefully to the wording of the hadith. She said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, this man, how he says, la yatiha. He does not have any relations with her for one reason or another. He's impotent, he's not attracted to her, he's busy. One reason or another, there's no intimacy between the two. She then said, وَأَنَّهُ لَيْسَ مَعْهُ إِلَّا مِثْلُ هُدْبَةِ And this man, and I don't know يعني, what, to what extent we can translate this hadith with regards to those who are here, youngsters, older people, some people may get offended. Al-Muhim, she says, لَيْسَ مَعْهُ إِلَّا مِثْلُ هُدْبَةِ She says, that this man, he only has this, hudba. Taraf al-thawb, if not smaller than that. He has a hudba, that's it. We'll leave it as that. He doesn't come to me, he doesn't sleep with me, and he only has a hudba. He says, mithlu hudba, something like the end of one's garment. So the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, what did he say? Did he criticize her? Aib alik, as many of us would say today. Wallahi aib alik. You can't say that about your husband. Astaghfirullah, stahi. Everybody understand this? And this is crucial with regards to these points. Because the Prophet وسلم, he accepted something, he said something, and he stopped at a point. But what he didn't do, he did not neglect and ignore the situation. Everybody clear on this? So the Prophet وسلم, he was asked this question for what? Why did she say that he isn't intimate with her and he only has a hudba, the likes of a hudba? Because of what? She didn't want to be with him anymore. And she wanted to go back with who? Rifa'ah. She wanted to marry who? Rifa'ah, the, the original husband. So the Prophet وسلم, he stopped her. He said, La, no, you can't do that until something takes place. Until Until you take a spoonful of his honey. And until he takes a spoonful of your honey. In other words, once something takes place, you can go back and remarry the file. Until that takes place, you can't, you must remain with this man. What does this authentic hadith teach us? It teaches us that there's nothing wrong with asking questions pertaining to sexuality. There's nothing wrong with being concerned, being educated, and being aware of certain things that take place between a man and a woman. Concerns, complaints, desires, etc. And the proof or the wajhud shahid or the wajhud dilata from this is that anna nabi alayhi lam yunkir alayha. He didn't criticize her. He didn't say you can't talk about your husband, it's ghiba, it's backbiting. What type of woman are you? What do you want from your husband? Why aren't you pleased with your husband? He's a good man, so on and so forth. Rather, he gave her the solution, but the Prophet ﷺ was not obscene. He was not lewd. He was not flirtatious. He did not go beyond the boundaries. He gave her a simple, clear instruction, and he also spoke indirectly. It's not matter of kinayat. He says, you cannot leave this man and go back to the file until you taste his honey and he tastes yours. In other words, there must be intercourse between you and between him. So look how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with this situation. He mentioned the cure, the solution, and he did not get stuck on the reason behind the problem. Many parents today, the son, the daughter, they go to you, what do you mean you have a girlfriend? How do you have a girlfriend? What are you doing with a girlfriend? No, you can't do that. Why did you go there? Why did you say this? Why did you drink this? We get caught up, caught up, caught up in the problem instead of dealing with the actual solution. Listen, son, it's haram for you to have a girlfriend. It is natural and it's a good thing for you to have natural desires. There's nothing wrong with that. However, those desires have to be in the boundaries of Islam. This could happen to you. That could happen to you. It's disrespectful. Allah gave you so, so on and so forth. You give them a solution and not get caught up and stuck on the actual what? The actual problem. So the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salam, he didn't seek any detail. Why doesn't he go to you? Why is only have mithlu hudba? Why, why, why? He says, if you want to go back to Rifa, that's fine. But there's a rule, and there's a ruling. And that ruling is, he divorced you three times, there has to be some type of intimacy. So this hadith, it teaches us balance, and it teaches us moderation. Not to hide, not to duck, not to ignore, not to neglect, but at the same time, keep the boundaries. 
keep the boundaries. You don't have to be lewd and obscene when you talk about these things, but it doesn't mean that you can cover them up and ignore them. The prophet, he spoke in short, quick, sweet words, and the woman, she understood exactly what he was what? What he was saying, alayhi salatu salam. So let's, let's ask the question now. If she says, إِنَّهُ لَا يَأْتِيهَا وَلَيْسَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا مِثْلُ هُدْبَةً That is a discussion of what? Something that's private and intimate between what? Two spouses in the bedroom. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he sat down and he did what? He listened to her complaint and he gave her the solution. So those who say and those who feel there's no such thing as sex education in Islam. There's no such thing as sexual uh, or sex uh, awareness in Islam. There's no such thing as learning about anatomy and before you get married, there's no such thing as that. That's from the kuffar, that's dirty, that's low, that's bad, that's base. We see these people, they have strayed a bit from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam sunnah. Now let's mention another hadith, bi'idhin nayh subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, once again inside Bukhari, reading from Fatwa al-Bari, volume 1, page 388. Imam al-Bukhari, he says, Kitab al-Ghusl, babun idha ihtalamat al-mar'a. حدثنا عبد الله بن يوسف قال أخبرنا مالك عن هشام بن عروة عن نبي عن زينب بنت أبي سلمة عن أم سلمة أم المؤمنين أنها قالت جاءت أم سليم امرأة أبي طرحة إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت يا رسول الله إن الله لا يستحي من الحق هل على المرأة من غسل إذا هي احتلمت فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم إذا رأت الماء إمام البخاري he says the chapter of غسل and in this chapter he has a subheading that says, when a woman has a dream, when a woman has a dream at night, he gives you his isnad that goes back once again to Hisham ibn Urwa, from Zainab, from his father Urwa, from Zainab bint Abi Salama, who narrated from Um Salama, who said that one day Um Sulaim, the wife of Abi Talha radiallahu anha, she went to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. And when she got to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, she said, she said something to him. She gave a brief preface, a brief introduction. She says, Inna Allaha la yastahi min al haq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not shy from the truth. Allah, the most high and the sublime, isn't shy from the truth. In other words, because Allah isn't shy from the truth, please excuse me for what I'm about to say. Because Allah isn't shy from the truth, Please don't get upset, don't get angry for what I'm about to ask you. That could be shameful, that could be bashful, that could be embarrassing, that may be inappropriate to the Arab custom. However, there's someone who is bigger and greater than our customs. There's something that's more important and substantial than what we feel is aib. And he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah la yastahi min al-haq. Allah isn't shy from the truth. After she said that, she bluntly asked the Prophet sallallahu does a woman have to make a ghusl? Does a woman have to make a ghusl if she has a dream, a wet dream, nocturnal emission? Does she have to make a ghusl? The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam in this narration, if he had a riwayah, he says, Naam, yes, if she sees water, literal translation, if she sees water. There's another version of this hadith in which one of the sahabiyat, she covered her face and she put her head down. One version says, Fadahta nisa. She says, you're exposing the women. You're embarrassing the woman. Another narration that the Messenger of Allah himself, he said, Taribat yaminuk fabima yushbihuha waladuha. He says, may your right hand become dusty and dirty. If a woman doesn't have a dream, if it wasn't a, a woman doesn't have quote unquote water, then how will her child resemble her? So let's break down this hadith once again. There was a woman, a sahabiyah, not a man. It's very interesting now. She went to the Prophet and she asked the question of some type of sexuality, something pertaining to sex, to intercourse, something pertaining to something that's embarrassing, that's shy. However, as another report, another narration of the hadith says, فَلَئِنْ نَسْأَلْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ فَنَكُونَ مِنْهَا عَلَى بَيِّنَةٍ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَنْ نَكُونَ مِنْهَا عَلَى عَمْيَا She says, it's better for us to ask the Messenger of Allah something that may be embarrassing, to have the clear knowledge, to know the right thing to do, instead of being blind and ignorant. That's a golden principle in Islam. It is better to have that difficult conversation with your teenage son instead of you being blind in the world and in the deen as well. So the Prophet والسلام, he said, Naam. He says, yes, she has to make a ghusl, of course. One version, another version states, in the men and nisa Women are no more than the twins of men, the partners of men. If a man has a dream, he has to make a ghusl. 
If a woman has a dream, she has to make ghusl with one condition. Ida ra'atil ma, when she sees water. Let's ask the question. First and foremost is, the first point of embarrassment is a woman having a dream about a man. Number two, going to the Messenger of Allah والسلام, who is the most shy. Number three, he says, Ida ra'atil ma, when she sees water. How does a woman have a dream, wake up and see water? The anatomy of a man is totally different than the anatomy of a woman. When a man reaches climax, something happens, something takes place. There's a clear proof and evidence that he reached climax. When a woman reaches climax, it could be a clear proof and evidence, and it may not be. In other words, the Sahabiyah, why she was so embarrassed, she said in a thousand words, you're proving that the women have an abundance of lust for men. So lustful that when she has the dream, she wakes up and she sees ma, water, discharge, ejaculation. Everybody understand this? So the Prophet والسلام, what did he do once again? Be quiet. Don't speak on these things. That's not important. It's aib, la, haya, so on and so forth. He didn't say none of those things. Nor was he obscene. Nor was he lewd. Nor did he go beyond the boundaries, but he dealt with the situation. And he gave the clear, basic ruling. One of the students of the Messenger of Allah, one of his most prized pupils was Aisha radiallahu anha. From the foremost, or from the most foremost graduates of his madrasa. And she said about some other students, they weren't as good as she was, but they were still good students. Inside Bukhari and inside Muslim, she said, Ni'man nisa'u nisa'u al-ansar. She says, the Ansari women were excellent women. They were strong women. They were good women. Why were they so strong? Why were they so good? Why were they so virtuous? Uh, he says, they never allowed shyness to prevent them and yet to stop them from seeking fiqh of the religion. So there's a shyness that is good and there's a shyness which is bad. So these two hadiths and there are many others in which the Prophet speaks on these issues that may be embarrassing and difficult and is the prophetic cure and the guidelines for your relationship between you and your son. Your son asks you a question, the first thing that you should do is what? What's the first thing that the Prophet did in these two hadiths that we mentioned? Both of them in the Sahihain. What did he do? He listened, I sent. The very first thing he did was what? He listened. Many of us are horrible listeners, terrible listeners. We don't know how to listen. Talking, giving us out, we don't even know how to listen. We're not even willing and ready to listen. What are you talking about? Astaghfirullah, a'udhu billah. No, get out of here. That's the first step. So after the Prophet was a good listener, he did what? He refrained from dwelling on the reason. He refrained from dwelling on the problem, but he immediately gave a simple and clear solution. He didn't bite his tongue, he didn't hold back, he gave the people whatever they needed. You want to get married, you want to get divorced, you want to make a ghusl, you have a desire, you have a lust for men. That is something which is considered to be natural. It's natural. So therefore, in 2016 and in 2017, the very first step with regards to dealing with these sensitive issues, these topics, homosexuality, LGBT, whatever the case, is that you have to be willing to listen. You don't have to agree. You don't have to give your ruling. You may not know the answer. But you're not a good parent if you do not know how to listen. And if you yourself cannot listen, then it is mandatory for you to steer them in the direction of someone who what? Who can and will listen. That's the very first step. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best the effects of those who lend their ears, who aren't judgmental, who don't try to expose them, they keep their secrets, and then if they have the ability to give some beneficial advice. Many questions that are posed to the people of knowledge are not actual rulings, but it's nasa'ih, pieces and points of advice. So the first sign of a good parent with regards to Canada, the United States, the UK, your children, and issues of sexuality is that you have to do what, Nafis? You have to listen. Number two, refrain from being judgmental. Put yourself in his shoes. You came to America years ago. You were born in America, you were raised in the 60s, in the 70s. The trials and the tribulations are like night and day. From the beginning of time, and one of the most early, or the, from the earliest uh, crimes in society was prostitution. Prostitution, a woman selling her body, a man forcing a woman to sell her body for money. It's nothing new. Lust, passion, 
sexual desires is old. However, smartphones, internet, the amount of propaganda that's thrown and hurled at a Muslim teenager in 2016 is totally unprecedented. So you can't fight a war if you don't know who your enemy is. You cannot fight a war in a battle if you're not real and open. That 2016 is nothing like 1980. 2016 is nothing like 1960. Toronto, Canada is nothing like my country, full of Muslims, full of knowledge, full of masajid. It's night and it's day. And the moment you try to take that blueprint or that template and apply it to the letter and to the T in 2016 in a Western country is going to be direct failure. And it's going to be a disaster for you and for your son and for your daughter unless Allah Azawajal protects. Everybody clear on this. So after you listen, you have to be realistic. You have to be real with yourself. And that's what we mentioned last night, being truthful, being honest, not having fake piety. The third step is... To give them what we mentioned is al-badil al-salih, a substitution. You like girls. There's nothing wrong with liking girls. It's fine. It's perfectly fine to like girls as a, for a boy. That's natural. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. However, you have to tweak it now. You can't have a girlfriend, but you can't have a wife. You can have a girlfriend, but you can't have at least one wife. He said, wives. <laughs> Taif, that's another discussion. Taif. Many parents, if most parents, unfortunately, and we don't get into the concept of marriage not yet because that's a very long discussion. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes left. Khair, inshallah. We say, after listening, a person has to be truthful with regards to the time and the situation. And before we get into giving a solution, a person must be truthful with regards to what they can and cannot do. Every parent doesn't have the ability to speak with his or her child. Every guardian doesn't have the ability to give the proper Islamic advice and the proper Islamic ruling. However, you must realize yourself. What type of person you are and what type of person that you aren't. Son, I can't help you with this situation. I don't know. You ask me the ruling, I don't know. I honestly don't know. However, the Imam at the Masjid knows. Uncle Fulan knows. My brother, he's more hip. He's more cool. You always had a good relationship with him. There may be a sour relationship between father and son, between mother and daughter. If you can't deal with the situation, then it is mandatory for you to put them in the direction of those who properly can. Everybody understand this. Uh, from what I heard when I came in the masjid is uh, having husnul dhan for the child, having husnul dhan for your son by the imam, having husnul dhan, having good thoughts. You don't know what happened that night when they drunk or smoked, or they were alone with that boy or that girl. You don't know what happened. You don't know how they were feeling. You don't know what shaitan was saying, what the nafs was saying. You don't know how long the battle was. They were fighting to avoid that bad act or that bad thought. It happened. It took place. It makes no sense to dwell upon the past. What is important is dealing with the present and the future, getting out of the hole, getting out of the pit, fixing yourself. Now, when we talk about sexual uh, education and awareness in Islam and these different issues, homosexuality, lesbianism, people changing their genders, getting surgeries, all different things like this. We said that you have to be transparent. You have to be transparent. A lot of this stuff is crazy. When I was growing up, it wasn't like this, son. It was unheard of. People said that it was unnatural, it was a disease, it was a sickness. Your time, you're going to college, they say it's natural to be like that. It's natural to feel like this. It's okay to watch this and to listen to that. There's nothing wrong with it. So you have to have an open, honest discussion with your son. What do you think about that, son? You think that makes sense? You think your body was made to be with a, a, a person of the same sex? Is that logical when you use the bathroom? Does that make sense how Allah made you in your private part to be with um, another man, another woman? Is that logical? Reproduction of children, does that make sense? For a person to be made to be with the same sex. Does that make sense to you? Ask them the question. You like girls? Okay, great. What do you like about girls? What do you like about boys? You think he's cute? Have an open conversation with her. And you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked about what you didn't know about your child. You'll be shocked how much love and respect they will have for you just for opening up the table and being honest and not judging them. Nothing to do with halal and haram. 
asking them their feelings, their thoughts, and their opinions. Now, many parents, they can't do this, obviously, but it's something that you have to work on. Jihad or nafs. And we said that the believer is always attached to one type of jihad, one way or another. So I'm not the best parent, I'm not the most eloquent, I'm not the most vocal, but I have to work on it. And if I'm unwilling to work on it, then let me allow you to speak to someone who is. Khair inshallah, this will conclude the first session. Hopefully tomorrow we're going to get into the details, what is bad, what is good, what you can, what you cannot, can and cannot do. Uh, with regards to marriage, uh, Zina, uh, one of the younger brothers here in the masjid, he personally came to me and he said, please discuss the concept of impotence. Right here in this masjid last night. He says, talk about impotence and men that are impotent. All of these things, we will discuss tomorrow in the second session. Hopefully this is clear. Uh, you don't have to agree. You may disagree. That's totally fine. But hopefully that is clear. We ask Allah to guide all of the Muslim youth, I mean, to protect all of the Muslim youth and to keep them steadfast and upright in front of these challenges in the modern era. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Wa jazakumullahu khairan.